Welcome to CSA's webinar series, CSA Cloud Bytes. Today's webinar is titled Shifting Cloud Security Left to Protect Data and Customers. A few housekeeping items before we get started, please enter any questions that you have during the presentation in the Ask Questions tab at the bottom of your screen. We'll reserve time towards the end of the webcast to address these questions. Additionally, the slides from this webinar are not going to be provided. However, you can access this recording anytime by using the same link to view the webinar again. Today, I am joined by Lady Steffel. She has been working at Viacom CBS Digital since September 2019 as a cloud cyber analyst managing security, compliance, and risk, and maintaining a couple dozen multi-cloud environments with many of the business units in Viacom CBS. Lady has a prior affiliation to being a Dell Scholar, a student ambassador and business student at UC Berkeley. Raised in data centers, she has always been intrigued by the complexities of networks and enjoys experimenting with cutting edge technology and innovation. The last five years were spent specializing in IDS, IPS software while helping a variety of industry verticals and special events. I also have with me Chris Deramus, who is the co-founder and CTO of Divi Cloud, where he leads the engineering team while driving new innovation. He is a technical pioneer whose passion is finding innovation and elegant new ways to deliver security, compliance, and governance to customers running at scale in hybrid cloud environments. He remains deeply technical, writing code, and diving into the latest technologies and services being deployed by partners like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, VMware, and OpenStack. We're really excited to have Sadie and Chris with us. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our presenter. Really, um, you know, really, really excited to be here with uh, you know Sadie. Um, thanks for your time, everyone that's on the um, attendee list here. Uh, we're going to be talking about shifting left. Uh, really, some uh, practices that can be employed to uh, do it successfully. Why this is becoming such an important paradigm in the cloud security um, space today. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of do an intro into, um, you know, Divi Cloud and do a few questions about how you can properly employ shifting left strategies, and then we'll uh, finish things off with Q&A at the end. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest here, Sadie, who's going to kick things off with uh, how things work over at CBS and Viacom. Yes, thank you, Chris. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Hope you all are safe and well. Um, so my name is Sadie Steffel. I am the Senior Cybersecurity Analyst over at Viacom CBS Digital. We can go into more as to what Viacom CBS Digital is because it sits in a very unique space. So uh, you're going to see two, two different names here, Viacom CBS Digital and CBS Interactive. The same company, we're just going to do a merger. Um, so our name is going to transition into Viacom CBS Digital. When you think about uh, CBS Interactive, Viacom uh, CBS Digital, it's just an internet brand is the way to think about it, right? So um, anything that is off the traditional network, and when I say network, I mean, you know, you're watching TV on cable, that's more of the traditional type of network. Um, anything off of the network, so whether you're on your phone, your iPad, you know, you have a smart TV and you utilize the applications. Uh, so, you know, if you're watching the Super Bowl and you're streaming it or you're on Comic Vine, you're playing uh, games, you're looking at the CNET reviews, or uh, you're doing something else creative within one of our other brands, watching Showtime, uh, getting your news, setting the push alerts, uh, trading on your fan fantasy football teams, all of those things we can say, you know, smart data that falls under the IoT, uh, you know, new age of streaming would fall under the CBS interactive category. And we're actually one of the largest internet brands. Um, so we fall relatively around the same area as Apple and Google. And taking a look at this slide, you know, you can see some of our logos here. So um, if you have any other questions at the end of this as to regard to what CBS Interactive is, because it's quite interesting, just let me know. I'll be happy to answer anything transfer off to Chris, who can tell you a little bit more about Divi Cloud. Thanks a lot, Sadie. So, you know, Divi Cloud, um, we're very much focused on the uh, cloud security posture management space, CSPM. It's been a 
uh, defined space now for a couple of years as the you know, cloud security misconfiguration issue just continues to kind of manifest. And we really focus a lot on, uh, you know, public cloud infrastructure. So, um, you, know, a, you know, AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, Alibaba, and even Kubernetes, which is really making uh, a lot of advancements in the cloud uh, space in terms of portability. Uh, we really focus a lot on, um, you know, misconfigurations, a lot of the insider threat. Um, and so, you know, you think about public S3 buckets, public Elasticsearch, a lot of these things we, we seemingly uh, read about day in and day out. Uh, that's really our, our bread and butter. And we look for policy violations across security compliance as well as governance. Um, we, we pick up guard duty signals and things from external threats from the cloud native services. And lastly, really focus on IAM challenges. Now, the way that we've really approached the problem, we're, we're an on-premises platform that our customers deploy into their own Amazon or Google or Azure accounts. And we are pervasively sort of scraping the cloud API plane in a, in a polling mechanism. And we get data quite fast, sometimes as quickly as you know, 60 seconds. So we're able to detect misconfigurations very, very quickly. Um, but we've seen a real big shift in, in the market today. And, you know, even if you're reacting within 60 seconds, oftentimes that's, that's not quick enough. And so really the market has really been clamoring for a way to detect these misconfigurations in a more proactive preventative model. And so reactive compliance is, is great. You have to have that as a, as a piece to the puzzle. Uh, but it, as we transition here to the, to the next slide, you'll actually see that it's, it's really all about now trying to build a better workflow for your developers, your DevSecOps teams to take the same type of reactive control plane you have today and shift that left downstream into your CI CD pipeline um, to get better feedback, to get um, a better experience for, for your developers. Um, and so by linking to tools such as, you know, Jenkins and Circle CI and Travis, a lot of these common tools that are used to get workloads out to the cloud quickly to you know innovate as fast as possible um, you want to be able to inject that same type of scanning at that at that layer and that really gives you nice tight preventative controls and better assurances that the misconfigurations that we're routinely seeing today actually are caught before they manifest in the wild so you don't have to worry about it being an issue for 60 seconds or God forbid hours or days. And so really this allows better protection and you know, better peace of mind for the security teams that their developers are leveraging the power and the benefits of cloud, but in the right way. Um, and so as we sort of think about the problem, um, you know, we, we really, there's, there's lots about shifting left, but our, our main focus as, as Divi Cloud, since we really focus on cloud configuration is around things like Terraform, um, Amazon CloudFormation templates, all those native templating languages. We're, we're integrating into those and being able to scan them and dynamically link them to what we know about our, our customer cloud footprints today. So it's not enough to look at compliance through the lens of what will be provisioned when that developer pushes the big, the big red button. You wanna also uh, link to existing resources that you know about to make sure that you're not opening yourselves up to cross account IAM access, that you're not linking as a developer to a security group that already exists, but's too permissive in terms of allowing ingress access. This ability to dynamically link provides a better experience for both teams. Um, and it really gives you more comprehensive analysis that's gonna span multiple clouds. And so, you know, when we, when we think about compliance and we think about security, we, we like to embrace it through a uh, lens that spans all of the cloud service providers. And so you define your, defini your definition of good once, and you're able to see the compliance events and misconfigurations across all cloud service providers. Um, and we wanna take that same reactive lens, shift that downstream, and you now have you know, a ability to shift left and get that analysis across Azure, Kubernetes, Alibaba, as well as AWS. Um, and then lastly, compliance is not the same for everybody. You know, we, we have a lot of the great, great controls like the CIS benchmarks and, you know, GDPR and PCI. These frameworks we're all working hard to align around, and those are fantastic. 
But ultimately, your definition of good is always going to be unique and centric for every customer that uses cloud because they do it differently. So you have to have customizable enforcement that really gives the flexibility that SecOps teams need to, to properly define uh, cloud compliance. Um, you know, Sadie right now is going to take you through kind of uh, the view over Viacom CBS and how they approach shifting left. Yeah, so thank you, Chris. Let's just think about, you know, shifting left as uh, involving the security earlier in the development cycle. So this doesn't necessarily mean Terraform, right? Uh, and the main goal is, for us is just to increase the quality of the software life cycle. You know, so we want to reduce the amount of time that we're spending at the end, uh, you know, cleaning up steps that have, could have happened at the beginning. Um, and some of these things, uh, you know, if they're not caught, they could be detrimental to the brand. Um, so the whole main idea is just to change that perception of, you know, involving security earlier so that everybody saves time along the way. Um, the developers save time, operation saves time, security saves time. You know, this also equivalents into um, cost spendings. Uh, so like I said earlier, you know, shifting left doesn't mean involve necessarily uh, the IAC, the Terraform module. However, if you do have the Terraform IAC, it is a, a large additive because uh, with tools like Divi Cloud, you can be able to scan your Terraform code and see any of the things that Chris is talking about, you know, whether it be a misconfiguration or some sort of firewall, a, um, um, and uh, really, really get ahead of this. So taking a look here, you know, it's, it's nearly impossible to uh, achieve these design documents, but you don't want to spend as much time with the after the fact scans and, you know, doing all of that investigation and triaging all the way at the end. And you're never going to hear a security person or a DevOps person talk about how much time they have on their hands, right? Everybody has got a thousand projects. Uh, so being able to shift left opens up a lot of that time at the end so you are able to work on a lot of other projects and it is a much smoother process. So why shift left, right? Um, so you can see this as the benefits of shifting left. You know, your, uh, your risk is reduced by a ton, right? Because now you're really getting ahead of this. So it's becoming a minimal amount. Like I said, you know, we're having cost, cost savings, um, time savings, quality control. So when we think about this, and you know, you get in that healthy perpetual habit of everybody working together, then by the time you're ready to launch your app or your website or whatever it may be, your speed to market is a little bit quicker. Um, the largest benefit for us is uh, company culture, and I want to spend a lot of time talking about this one because it's really important, um, but company culture is enhanced just overall. People are, the number one thing for me is always education, you know, if everybody's learning, uh, then it's a positive environment. So um, I'll spend some more time going into that. Chris, is there anything else you wanted to add into, you know, why it's important to shift well? No, I think I think you're spot on. I mean, the the education component really is is what we like to talk about. You know, you're, you know, with the consumerization of cloud, more and more people are using it, and uh, they're they're using a very very powerful suite of tools without the knowledge of like how to use them properly. And so, if the security teams can teach these people how to fish and do it effectively, they're becoming better consumers of of cloud computing and using it the way that it was intended to be. And it really helps security, again, just give them that, that, that peace of mind um, that, that things are going to continue to operate as, as they should. So better education is just good for everyone. And doing it in a way where developers feel more naturally inclined to leverage it really speaks volumes. If you can work with their own set of workflows, with their own set of tooling, and just make it a more seamless and tightly integrated experience, it's better for everybody. 
Great, yeah, so question of the day, how, does, uh, how do we do it here at Viacom CBS Digital? So um, the first thing, you know, is just understanding what shifting left is going to mean to your organization, and this can be different for everybody. Uh, so let me kind of give a little bit of how our operations works. So we have lots of different units, uh, as you saw on the slide, you know, we have sports, we have showtime. Um, so every unit, even for us, is going to operate completely different than the other one. And we really have to figure out, you know, what is going to be beneficial for each unit. Um, so. I would say create some sort of cloud policy or cloud checklist, maybe both. Um, like I said, it's going to be different for everybody. You know, so that way uh, we have cloud policy. This is the way that we should be building and architecting things. And here's a checklist. You know, here's some things that you can do along the way just to make sure that we're really following through this uh, process with that quality control. Um, the number one thing that my CISO always talks about is, you know, we're not going to make DevOps work around us. We're going to try to find a way to allow security to work with DevOps. You know, so when I talk to my units, my number one thing is always, I don't want to stress you out. I know that we're both very busy. And when I ask you to do these things, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed in any sort of way. You know, I want to sit down and figure out a way that it's going to work for the both of us. And let's come up with this vision and this timeline and these goals. Um, of course, you know, sometimes goals aren't always met, but that's okay. As long as I see that the risk is going down, you know, I see maybe one or two changes have happened this week and not 20 changes. It's still a win in my book. Um, so I always just try to figure out what is going to be the best workflow that we can both work together. Um, half of the battle, I would say, is coming up with the people process and procedure for everybody, right? So for us, we're quite large. So it, it takes a, a good amount of time to figure out who needs to be incorporated, what time they need to be incorporated, um, and really ironing that out. The other half of it is going to be understanding the software creation, right? And like I said, I have all sorts of different teams. And as we know, people are so different even within themselves. So understanding what is their creation cycle, you know, what is going to be the benefit for me to work with them? Uh, I would also say, even though they may not be in the software that we provide all the time, I still arm my development teams with the tools that they need. So that way, when I'm explaining something to them, you know, whether it be Divi Cloud or another one of our tools, they have the ability to go in and check for themselves and kind of look and see where I might be coming from. Or at the same time, you know, like I said at the beginning, if they're working on something, then I have a dev cluster spun up for them that they can be able to scan their own Terraform without me. But I really try to make sure that they are educated and that they understand where the security team is coming from. So that way, you know, we can all understand each other's uh, job attribution. Um, the last thing is I allow for feedback. All the time I check in with every single one of my units and I always ask them, you know, how are you doing? How, you know, how did this go? Uh, were we able to clean this up? What is the new timeline? And I'm always adjusting, adjusting, adjusting from there. Um, but I try to check in, you know, every couple of weeks and just to make sure. Um, as I said earlier, I really think it's a, it, it, it's within our culture, um, you know, that security is figuring out just how software is working within every unit and what is going to be the best for them. So security is really adapting to all these different teams. Um, but at the same time, we're really learning and growing um, from everybody. So it's just a great experience for not only the security team, but for the developers. That's great, City. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, and so, you know, we, we get off, we actually get, get, get asked this often um, as, as we're talking to, you know, customers and customer prospects, you know, what are, the, what are the challenges as I start to embrace this new paradigm of kind of moving my compliance and my security, uh, you know, left and working with, with developers more? Um, you know, first off, I think it's, you know, evaluating the tooling out there, whether it's native tooling, open source tooling, or commercial products. 
um, you're seeing a, a lot of new products pop up that you know offer services in, in this space. And when, when you do that, um, you really want to think about a consistent approach to this experience. So what you're doing reactively upstream in, in, in the cloud should mirror the stuff that you are putting in place for those del you know, developers. And again, I just can't emphasize it enough that it is, it is a better experience for the developer. If they pass your shift left level of checks, they should have assurances that once they go live, their application workload is good, good to go. If it gets shut down an hour or a day later, it just creates friction uh, between, between the various teams. Um, so, you know, b being able to have consistency is going to be key and not having to maintain two different definitions of good. Also trying to align around, you know, leading and popular compliance frameworks. And that, again, that, that really is a point of emphasis here. Um, there are so many great frameworks out there that really help you navigate a lot of these really common pitfalls and, um, you know, common attack vectors. So, you know, work to align around the, you know, some of the CSA frameworks, uh, you know, some of, you know, GDPR, PCI, NIST, 853, these are all fantastic frameworks. And when you build these, these controls, you know, think, think about your developers aligning to those. I think that will ultimately result in a, in a better experience. Sadie, are you, you know, just curious about some of the challenges that you've actually seen? As, yeah, so, um, I think this falls just into any sort of uh, security process, uh, whether that be like a software implementation or, you know, a policy. It's just that enforcement people and processes, uh, you know, you can have all the security tools on the planet, but if you don't have the right team and procedure governance in place, then, you know, it's still not going to operate correctly. So I think really establishing that that trust and that confidence um, in development in ops is extremely important, and you know making everyone feel like they have a voice and that they are a contributor um, will help overcome a lot of those challenges. Absolutely, and you know we see see a lot of our customers forming cloud centers of of excellence. It's something that's been you know, really increasing over, over the past year, take, take that model and shift that down to your developers reward, you know, them, ad, you know, adapting to this, to this model and starting to, to lessen these, these compliance infractions. Um, you know, you really have to incentivize and, and reward to uh, make folks further embrace this brand new model. Um, great. I think we have another question here for you, Sadie. What types of small errors? Uh, which cause high risk, high risk impact are solved by shifting to the left. Yes, yeah, so there's all types of small errors. I was just telling Chris yesterday, you know, code at one o'clock in the morning and code at 10 a.m. in the morning are seemingly very different things. So we're all guilty of working you know, maybe late or uh, when we're tired. So these small, tiny little things happen. Right, um, and some examples could include uh, networking, whether that be a high risk port, such as maybe like an RDP, or you you have all the ports open, um, a protocol, a protocol, you know, publicly accessible items is a huge one, right? So what if a developer accidentally switches one of your buckets to being public? What is in that bucket? What data was just released to the public? Uh, so really understanding, you know, if something has been modified or created that is public that shouldn't have been public. Um, IAM issues, uh, as we see in the news all the time, you know, you might have some sort of read uh, only coming in as an IAM issue and feeding data into your infrastructure somewhere, but what if another vendor was hacked and, you know, somehow the networks are linked? Um, you don't want some sort of IAM issue having a write capability when it shouldn't have had one in the first place. Um, outside of networking, I, um, yeah, I think that covers most of that. Chris, do you have anything that you would like to add with, you know, maybe small errors that you've seen with Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think you hit on, um, you know, a number of great ones. It's, um, you know, the, the, the cross account capabilities and the way that IAM permissions are leveraged today. I mean, it's, it's really easy to fat finger and typo a uh, 12 digit account ID. Um, and, you know, by, by doing that, you're unnecessarily opening up access, third-party access to S3 buckets, databases, a variety of 
you know, cloud resources where you can apply permissions at the resource level. So again, taking that context in into all of the accounts that are within your cloud footprint, vital to making sure that people are not unnecessarily linking resources. And then, I mean, just in terms of, you know, approved, you know, database technologies and engines and um, OS images and things of that nature. I mean, very easy to fat finger a AMI ID and deploy the wrong unapproved image. We hear about golden AMIs all the time. So, you know, it's uh, very, very important to take everything into context when provisioning cloud infrastructure. Yep. Uh, so last one, outside of security, what are some other use cases for shifting left? There's lots of benefits for shifting left, uh, you know, whether it be compliance or auditing, business continuity, disaster recovery, a really big one right now uh, is regulation, right? For GDPR, PCI, HIPAA, you don't want to deploy something and have a large fine sitting at the end of it. So, um, you know, that also comes into cost savings uh, as well. I think the biggest one for us is just time. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we, we see a lot of power around, um, you know, operational efficiency and also governance. And so, you know, runaway costs, we, we don't like to talk about, you know, cost forecasting or cost an analytics. There's lots of commercial products that focus on that and cloud native tooling, but, you know, clouds themselves make a good amount of money off of just mistakes. I mean, people can deploy a 16 or a 32 core system very, very easily today. Um, and so being able to sort of, you know, prevent misconfigurations from a, from a compute um, and storage capacity so people are not over provisioning resources and letting them run, run idle. Um, I, think, I think everyone on this, on this call has at least experienced once that, you know, shell shock when you see the bill and it's an extra, you know, five or God forbid a six digit number that's associated just to deploying the wrong instance type. So operational excellence can certainly benefit from this new shift left paradigm. So I think that certainly wraps up our um, presentation today. Uh, you know, I very much appreciate everyone's time. I think we've got some time for Q&A right now. If we'd like to go ahead and shift to the answers that have been, or questions, excuse me, that have been posed here in chat. All right, folks. Just a quick reminder, if you do have questions for the presenters today, enter them in that Ask the Question tab that's at the bottom of your screen. It looks like we have a handful that are already in our queue, so we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. So the first question that I have here says, how do organizations start shifting left? So just to repeat the question, um, it's how organizations start shifting left? Correct, yes. Correct, okay. Yeah, so um, I would just say, you know, try to figure out what shifting left is going to mean to your organization. You know, how is software created? What does your infrastructure look like? Who are the people that are going to be involved? What is the process? What is the timeline? And what is our ultimate goal? Um, so, you know, you don't have to roll it out to the entire organization. Maybe start with a unit or start with a specific project um, and just focus in on that, right? But it's all about the people process procedure. And like I said in the beginning, you know, half the battle is just figuring out what type of environment are we working with, right? Is it AWS? Is it GCP? Is it Azure? Is it Terraform? Is it IAC? Um, is it still old data center networking? Um, how many people? And what is going to be the best for them? You know, what is the best way for them to learn? What does their schedule look like? Are they feeling overwhelmed? Are they feeling stressed out? And how can we make this success overall? Chris, is there anything that you wanted to add into that? Uh, no, I think that's great. I mean, look, from my perspective, we, we've always had a you know added here at Divi Cloud, you know, First, nail it, then scale it, right? So start start small, start in, in, in an area which which you think you know maybe is lower risk that you can do some trial and error. And once you get a good a good process down, and you've seen you know the return on on investment, then start to scale it out across the organization. Um, you know sometimes you can bite off a bit more than you you know can can chew when you when you go after this, especially in a large organization. So so start. Start small. There's lots of great tooling out there, both open source as well as commercial, to, to get started. Sadie has mentioned quite a few 
throughout this uh, webinar today. Perfect. I have another question in the queue here, and they're asking just a little bit about um, your experience with AWS Cloud Security. Yeah, it's a really great question. I mean, look, um, Amazon as well as other cloud providers have really done a done a great job over the past uh, you know eighteen to twenty four months improving their cloud security posture, their cloud security tooling that's offered, as well as really taking more um, ownership in the shared responsibility model. If we focus just on AWS, um, you know, there's there's lots of things to focus in on from the uh, customer perspective. Obviously, you've got uh, in both encryption in transit, encryption at rest, you always want to make sure that you're uh, passing inf information securely over SSL slash TLS. Um, you've got encryption at rest. Of course, you don't want to have any you know, of your databases or data warehouses having data that's not encrypted on, on disk. Um, and you know, then you really want to think about um, identity access management. And there's, there's other talks that we've been doing, and you've heard a lot of you know, reInvent the past year, uh, identity access management is really becoming the new perimeter. You know, when, when you think about access to resources, gone are the days when you just should think about a firewall, right? I mean, you really have to think about identity because now identity goes well beyond just a, a human being, right? I mean, identities are associated with pretty much every asset type within Amazon. You know, you've got Lambda functions. You've got S3 buckets. You know, you've got roles that can be assumed by both your resources as well as AWS resources. So um, you really want to make sure you're getting a handle on identity, auditing it well, and making sure that you're not leaking permissions outside your, your organization. Um, and then, of course, you know, getting a good handle on security groups and, you know, um, access control lists to make sure that you're properly filtering um, access from, from the outside and where, where you can Always focus on restricting public access, you know, public IPs. You want to use back-end connections, VPC peers, and basically eliminate uh, as much traffic flowing over the Internet as possible. Awesome. The next question I have here is asking if there's any quick wins with shifting left and what those might be. Yeah, I mean, from my, from my perspective, certainly interested in what, what City has to say here on this topic as well, but... Uh, the first thing that we did, I mean, we're actually, uh, you know, compliance and, and, and security tool, and we have a lot internally that we do to protect ourselves. But we actually started from a governance perspective. And so um, as a company who really focuses on cloud innovation, we have to do a lot of R&D in the cloud. We have to try a lot of these new services and offerings out. And one of the things that we saw really quickly was, you know, developers – it's kind of like they're given a blank check and they get to go and do a, you know, car dealership and purchase whatever they want. Why are they going to purchase a, you know, a four-cylinder Toyota when they can get the Ferrari? So we were seeing people mistakenly provision larger assets, larger infrastructure than necessary, you know, 16 core systems, 32 core systems. When they go play with SageMaker or Azure, you know, Data Warehouse, just to name a few, they'd over-provision. And honestly, the cloud consoles themselves for the providers don't do a great job of really driving home the point that this is going to cost you X amount of dollars a month, a year. It, they sort of just show you those hourly costs, and unless you're running the numbers, you don't think about it. So we put two guardrails in place to really restrict the sizes of resources that our own developers and our own R&D teams can, can deploy. And those two simple controls were able to reduce our, our monthly bill by about 45%. So huge amount of savings if you extrapolate that over the course of, of a year. Um, and then we locked down the type of uh, services that could be, be deployed in these various accounts. So we wanted to make sure that the playground accounts were the only accounts where we were going and trying these new services, and the production accounts, those unauthorized services, were, which we were not greenlighting for production use, weren't actually being, being leveraged. And that enabled our... Uh, security team to really just get better visibility into the playground and it you know kind of prevented things from becoming a wild wild west if that makes sense I would also just add in, you know a quick win is changing that whole perception of hey we're going to shift less you know we're going to invo start involving security earlier in the software development cycle so just having that whole change of mindset and the perpetual practice of 
involving security early in the process whenever they can is just a quick win. Awesome. All right. The next question I have here is, do you guys have any lessons learned or common mistakes, if you don't mind sharing? So, I mean, I think everything is a, a lessons learned. And with anything you do, you know, there's, it's not going to be perfect any time. But I would suggest, you know, just, just keep practicing involving bringing security in, just keep talking about it. Always involve your people process procedures, you know, whether that be how you are going about cloud procedure or your security checklist, um, and just always allowing for feedback while never overloading or stressing somebody out. Yeah, and then from our perspective, I mean, we, we really had to treat it the same as really we do code reviews. And so er, early on, we were a smaller company. We were sort of just entrusting one person as a single point of, you know, contact to go ahead and do a lot of this stuff. And, um, you know, overall the process went well, being transparent. There's, there's going to be mistakes, and that's going to happen, I think, for, for companies large and small when you just have a single point of failure. You're not getting a second pair of eyes. So, you know, make sure we – sort of learned early on, you got to build a good review process, treat this just like you would any other pull request, and make sure you're getting multiple people reviewing the change before it's actually submit. All right. Looks like I just have one more question left here. So a reminder to our audience here, if you have any more questions for our presenters, please enter them in that Ask a Question tab. All right. The last one that I have in the queue currently says, what uh, has been the biggest benefit that you've seen from shifting last? So it's definitely going to be a cultural perspective, right? Because now you feel like not only is the security team part of your team, but all of the other development teams you're working with are also your team, you know, so you get to know more people and their experiences. And the result is just more education, right? So I think it's always a great process when you're learning more and you're getting to connect with other people in your organization um, and you're all working towards the same goal. Chris, is there anything you want to add? No, that's really it. I mean, for us, it's just been the, the um, education and the repeatability from it. I mean, we've, we've seen a sharp uptick in, you know, developers learning more and more about cloud, cloud services and it's, uh, it's been a lot more enjoyable, um, you know, a lot of a lot of developers don't want to you know click and you know and add, you know fumble their way through a through a, a, a web console. They'd rather read API docs or you know Terraform or CloudFormation Table docs and just sort of go go that way. Um, so we we've seen a sharp uptick in terms of education and knowledge of of the cloud services and um, you know just like Sadie says, just just the education and the, and the collaborative effect has been very rewarding for for Divi Cloud and its employees. Awesome. Well, it does look like that is all that we have for questions. So big thank you to Sadie and Chris for presenting today. We really appreciate all the time that it takes to put together a webinar like this, and you guys really provided some wonderful insights for our audience today. Additionally, I'd like to thank Vivi Cloud, who sponsored today's webinar. If anyone does have additional questions, feel free to email the Cloud Security Alliance research team at research at cloudsecurityalliance.org, and we'll get you connected with Sadie and Chris. Down below the presentation screen, you'll find a tab to rate and review the webinar. Please do so so we know what content you're enjoying and what we can improve upon. And finally, the recording of this webinar will be available within minutes of the conclusion. Simply use the same link to rewatch. If you'd like to view other recorded webinars or to sign up for new ones, you can go to cloudsecurityalliance.org slash research slash cloud site. Thank you everyone so much for attending today's webinar and have a wonderful day.